All right, well, it's the appointed hour. Uh, welcome to the faculty parent commencement seminar. My name is David Wright, and I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry. And today I'm going to talk to you about our work about developing low resource diagnostics for the developing world. And so my work is basically, this is my research group, the graduate students who actually do the experiments in my lab, the undergraduates who do the experiments in my lab. And we basically focus on three things. My lab, we work on drug discovery for malaria. We work on understanding biomimetic materials, how nature makes materials unlike anything we can make in the laboratory. And then what I'm going to talk about today, how you can make probes and diagnostics for discovering who has a disease. And so when we talk about the global impact of malaria, malaria puts 40% of the world's population at risk. There are 300 to 500 million clinical cases of the disease a year, and around the world it kills more than a million kids under the age of five. In 2010, the World Health Organization said that 880,000 children died in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, when the Titanic went down, about 2,000 souls lost their lives. So in a single year, the global impact of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa is equal to 463 Titanics. Right? So if James Cameron is interested about making a sequel to a tragedy, it shouldn't be Titanic 2. It should be a film about malaria. The problem is compounded because not only are these people uh, economically unable to fight the disease, there's resistance to all the truly affordable treatments in that part of the world. So the malaria parasite is a sneaky parasite. You get the disease when you're bitten by the female Anopheles mosquito. The mosquito bites you, and from her salivary glands, she injects the parasite, it's called a sporozoite, into your bloodstream. And those sporozoites target your liver. And they bury into your liver. And for about two weeks, they multiply. And they change their shape. And then they burst out of your liver. And they infect your red blood cells. It's during this red blood cell stage that people suffer the symptoms that we commonly associate with malaria. That's fever and chills. When the parasite is inside your red blood cells, it's consuming your hemoglobin, the molecule inside of each one of us that transports oxygen around the body. And so the parasite consumes 80 to 90 percent of the hemoglobin inside of a red blood cell. Then it bursts from that red blood cell. All the infected red blood cells burst at the same time. And that's what causes those fever and chills. And so what happens is then the parasites look for uninfected red blood cells. And the cycle continues over and over again with the parasite load getting higher and higher and higher. Occasionally, there's asexual reproduction of these merozoites. An uninfected a mosquito will bite a victim. And then you can spread the disease from someone with malaria to uninfected mosquitoes to people that don't have malaria. So in the United States, if you got sick, heaven forbid, you got food poisoning. Okay? You'd go to the hospital. This is Vanderbilt's Diagnostic Laboratory, state-of-the-art facility. We can uh, do tissue culture experiments on you. We can do the polymerase chain reaction to identify microbes. We can do blood chemistry. We can do enzyme and ion levels. We can do cell counting, coagulation studies. We can stick you in an MRI. All of these things require a tremendous amount of infrastructure that we, by and large, take for granted. There have to be safety cabinets, automated instrumentation. You have to have electricity 24-7. You have to have clean water. We need these dedicated trained staff. We need an informatics 
infrastructure so that you get your medical records from your doctor at the appropriate time to find out what the diagnosis was. This is how we do diagnostics in the United States. This is how we do diagnostics in rural Africa. Okay. A state-of-the-art lab might have a 35-year-old clinical centrifuge. We might have a microscope. The clean water at this research station is the five gallons that he brought with him today from the main hospital. Most of the, of the people in the field are trained community workers, not nurses, doctors, or diagnosticians. But the problem just isn't the research infrastructure, the diagnostic infrastructure in the developing world. There's also supply issues. Last month, we went on a uh, learning trip to Peru to see some of the places where people do these diagnostics in the field. And this is what happened, right? So if you're going to the field hospital and your truck gets stuck in the mud, let's not mention you know, how many PhDs does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, it took about four hours to get us unstuck. Right? Going by, by boat was a, better, was a better plan. But you know, there are supplies issues. These places are difficult to get to. We take that for granted when we can get on a highway or hop on a plane. Record keeping is an entirely different perspective. This is record keeping in a field hospital in uh, Peru, in the Andes Mountains. Everything is record. They have a record for every villager from 1945 to date, and it's a piece of paper. And so if there were a fire, or a mudslide, or a rainstorm, the entire medical history of those people would be wiped out. This is the Ames Hospital in New Delhi. This hospital sees 10,000 new patients a day. A day. They line up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they're processed. And the record that they carry with them is an office clinical card. They're responsible for maintaining their own medical records. So you know, how we handle the infrastructure, how we handle the supply line, how we handle the record keeping to communicate the results, how we handle the politics, because it's not uncommon that global health initiatives get lumped into the foreign aid debate. Okay. This is former Majority Leader Bill Frist, who's a faculty member at Vanderbilt. He wrote an, art, an article in this week that argued that if you look at the global health initiatives of the foreign aid budget, it, it's a big difference than just shipping piles of food to Angola. The global health initiatives are a pretty good bargain. Basically, the cost of antiretroviral therapies for HIV AIDS today is 15 times less than what it was 10 years ago. The investment in these global health initiatives saved foreign lives. The president's initiative for malaria, AIDS, and tuberculosis has saved 8.2 million kids who now get HIV retroviral treatment, 7.6 million children who've completed tuberculosis dot treatment, and 265,000 children that have received effective anti-malarial therapeutics through these initiatives. These global health initiatives save US lives, because by building an infrastructure that investigates neglected diseases, when those diseases come to the United States, we know something about them. And so I mentioned West Nile virus, which we did not have in this country before it showed up in New England and within seven years was in every state in the continental United States. Dengue fever, which is a, a, a pretty horrible virus that's been endemic in Latin Central America, is now active in Texas. These things are coming. And because we have made investments in neglected diseases and low resource diagnostics, we're better prepared than ever for facing those. They also enhance national security, and Governor Fr or Senator Frist finished by saying they're simply the right thing to do. 
This, however, is not the solution. This is another hospital that we saw in Peru where Direct Relief International shipped 22 of the same instruments to a regional hospital. Let's set aside the fact that there are no instruction manuals for these equipment. Let's set aside the fact that they're from the US so that they're 110 volt, not 220 volt. Let's set aside for the fact that the hospital doesn't, you know, at most would need one of these. But let's ask the fact these people didn't even ask for this equipment. This is not how we can promote effective diet, you know, translation of technology from the United States to low resource settings around the world. So for the last 10 years, scientists, chemists like myself, have asked the question, what can we do to promote the effective translation of technology from the, from the developed world to the low resource developing world? What is the formula that allows that to happen effectively? And so from the scientific perspective, sitting in our ivory tower, we've come up with this idea called ASSURED, which stands for any new diagnostic device that we make, we want it to be affordable, sensitive, specific, user friendly, rapid and robust, equipment free, because we don't want to fight this infrastructure problem, and deliverable. That is, whatever it, ha whatever it is, it really needs to be uh, useful for everybody who would use it in the context in which they will use it. And so to that end, two years ago, uh, we were awarded a grant from the National Institutes of Health to form the Vanderbilt Zambian Network for Innovations in Global Health Technology. And this is a partnership between Vanderbilt University, all these units inside Vanderbilt University, the University of Zambia, which is their leading public institution, and a rural research institute called the Malaria Institute of Macha, or the Macha Research Trust, as well as the Ministry of Health, the US President's Malaria Initiative in Zambia, and other institutions. And the idea here is now we will bring together a basic scientist and an engineer and a clinician from Vanderbilt and Zam or Zambia to form a team. And this team will work on a technology for a year at Vanderbilt. And then they'll actually go to Zambia for six to nine months and see if their idea really works. Because I can get a lot of things to work in a research lab. But the real world is an entirely different place. And that's where we need to make an impact. And so this type of program allows us to take our technologies and place them in the real world to see whether or not they actually work. And so one of the very first things we did was we asked our partners at the, at the rural hospital to come to Vanderbilt, they were here a couple of, week, couple of months ago in April, to talk to us about what the real problems were. Because in my office over in Stevenson, I have a great idea about how to make diagnostics for malaria and what it's like to fight malaria and what it's like to dr discover, you know. I've never had malaria. I've never tested a living person for malaria. I mean, th there's a context problem here. How, you know, what's the real problem? And so he came and he showed us this this chart. And the first thing you notice is that these, these are the rainy months every year. And shortly after the rainy months comes the malaria. Right? And every year there are hundreds of kids, thousands of kids, hundreds of kids. But about 2004, 2005, something amazing started to happen at the Macho Research Trust. They began implementing a homegrown solution to fighting malaria. Community-based, where people used effective diagnostics to figure out who were the carriers of the disease in the villages. This blip in 2005 is the result of actual drug shortage. 
And so they didn't have the drugs to implement the strategy. And so you can see here, you know, as the malaria cases decline, the other cases, this is mostly HIV AIDS is the problem now in this area, is rising. And so we went from losing about 1,000 kids at Matcha a year in 1994, 95, to, to losing one last year through a completely homegrown solution where they've almost effectively eradicated malaria, eradicated, a word that everybody who deals with this disease is afraid to use. And so we asked them, what do you really need to do this? Because now we had somebody who, could, who knew something about malaria, who fought malaria, who tested people for malaria, and what they said is we need to detect the asymptomatic carriers. We need to know who might have malaria in their system, but they don't look sick. Because those malaria Michaels and those malaria Marys are going to get bitten by uninfected mosquitoes, and those mosquitoes are going to spread. And suddenly, the, those parasites are going to be in people who didn't have the disease. Now they do have the disease and they're symptomatic. And so you'll have an outbreak. And so if you really want to eradicate malaria, and if we're going to think big, we might as well think big, we have to figure out how to detect the people that don't look sick. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to think about how do we detect the people today that do look sick. What's the current technology? And the gold standard today is the same gold standard that we've had for the last 50 years. We take a blood draw, we put it under a microscope slide, and we look to see whether or not we can see the parasites inside the infected red blood cells. The problem is, is that microscopy is not assured. Right? We, have, we need a special instrument, the microscope, which actually are pretty expensive from a developing world standard. We need trained microscopists. The overall cost of a microscope slide is pretty slow. It's pretty fast, and it's not bad. We can detect between 5 and 100 parasites per microliter. PCR, which is what we'd use in the United States to identify a staph infection or uh, something like that in the hospital, is highly sensitive. But a PCR machine costs $40,000. I just bought one last week. And so there's no way that you can put that in the field. It's a specialized piece of equipment, and the reagents have to be refrigerated. Well, we don't have refrigerators in rural sub-Saharan Africa. ELISA is a, is a laboratory-based assay that doesn't work. A promising solution is an RDT, a rapid diagnostic test. This is an example of one here. right? They're, you don't need special instruments. You don't need expertise. They don't cost a lot, about 50 cents. They're fast. They're not that sensitive. And so what we decided to do was we would develop technologies that would make RDTs work better. And so this is how an RDT works today. You have a strip. This is just like the home pregnancy test in the United States. Okay. On that strip, you have agents that are going to break open your red blood cells and that are going to bind your target, your antigen. We have a test line and we have a control line, antibodies that are looking for things to bind. We take a drop of blood, we put it on the, the piece of paper, the agents break open the red blood cell, the labeled antibodies bind the parasite, you add some flushing buffer, things start to wick up the piece of paper, we have these claws, essentially these antibodies bound to the paper looking for the parasite also. They bind the parasite and they bind at the control line. So this is a person that has malaria. The problem is, is that when the World Health Organization looked at the current rapid diagnostic tests, what they found was that they did not work very well. In 2009, only four tests had a detection rate greater than 
over half of the tests were no better than flipping a coin. We could do the test right now and say, sick or not, just by flipping a coin. The World Health Organization did an analysis of these tests, and some of these tests didn't even have reagents on them. They were counterfeited. The other thing that they found out was that these uh, rapid diagnostic tests really were not robust at the temperatures commonly encountered in Sub-Saharan Africa. They might have been great in France or Switzerland or Italy where they were made, but then you put them on an airplane in a cargo hold on a hot tarmac in Nairobi, Kenya, and the antibodies simply degrade. They unfold and they don't do what they're supposed to do. The World Health Organization published a way to improve, you know, procedures to improve these, and in fact, many of them did improve in 2011. 15 are now greater than 90% detection rate, and only about two, uh, 20 are better than flipping a coin. But there's still a huge problem here. And so we asked the question, how could we, how could we help? What could we do? And the idea was really simple. It's a device which we call the extractionator. It is no more complex than the piece of tubing you're holding in your hand right now. In fact, the air bubbles that you see in that tubing are what we refer to as these surface tension valves. And the way, the idea, the way this idea works is that we have these magnetic beads. And on the surface of these magnetic beads, we put reagents that will capture the biomarker that we're looking for. They're going to bind something that the malaria parasite makes that the human host doesn't make. And then we'll capture that biomarker, and we'll move it with a magnet. The magnet will collect all of these beads, and we'll move it across the valve from one solution to the next. And so along our tube, we'll have an array of solutions, each one purifying and concentrating the analyte so that by the end, we'll be able to spot it on an RDT and have a positive test result. So here you can see how the surface tension valves work. We've collected the beads with the magnet. We pull them through the valve. You can see how they're blebbing across. Now they've gone through. We use air bubbles, and we also use oil valves. Another way to think about these valves is you can make a valve structure here. This is passing various and assorted things to show exactly how stable they are. Bigger balls, base balls, footballs, and in every case, the surface valve tension maintains its integrity. So this idea that you can use a little bubble in a tube to isolate a biomarker, purify it, and concentrate it, it's one of these ideas that seems so simple, it's almost stupid. But it works. And so the first thing we asked ourselves are how can we control these surface tension valves? What are the scientific parameters that we have to do to make them stable? Because we're going to have to ship them all over the world. What factors are we going to have to, to do, use to reduce the force of the magnetic, required to make the magnetic beads go from one valve to the other? And then the other thing is how can we not contaminate one solution from the other when we pull these beads through? And so we did a whole bunch of experiments, and this is some of the results. One of the things that we showed, so this is an experiment that shows how much force is required for the valve to fail, for the two solutions to mix. This is a fun experiment. You put it on a centrifuge, and you spin the centrifuge around, and, you, and finally the valve collapses. And so we found that the smaller the diameter of the tube, the more stable the valve. We found the tubing material was important. 
And we found the type of solutions that were touching the valves was also important. We also measured how much force was required to get the magnet, magnetic beads to go through a valve. And there is a trade-off, because the smaller the tubing, the more force we needed. But if we increased the mass of the beads that were capturing the biomarker, which turned out to be the right thing to do, we needed less force. And so there's a trade-off between the factors that make the valve stable and let us concentrate and isolate the biomarker of interest that we can sort of plot so that where we have high stability and easy pull through, this sort of quadrant is where we want to design our device. Up here or out here or out here, that wouldn't be so favorable to a stable device. The other thing is that in each instance, we had between one and two microliters go from one chamber to the other. So there are 100 microliter chambers. We have a very small amount go over. It's a hundredfold purification every time we cross a valve, 100 to 1. So how does this work for malaria? So this is our biomarker for malaria. It's called the histidine-rich protein 2. This protein is it's exactly what it says it is. It's rich in histidine. Okay? Every, every H in red is a histidine in this protein. And what's important about histidine is that histidine likes to bind metals. So if we take a magnetic bead and we put a metal on the surface, in this case a nickel, that protein is going to bind our magnetic bead. And then we'll be able to use our magnet to pull the magnetic beads away from all of the contaminants in a blood sample into the next solution to purify it. Well, we did some studies to figure out how long this would take, because one of the things is that if you get the people to come to the hospital, and it's a huge burden for them to take a whole day off, you've got to get the results to them quickly. So an RDT takes. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. If we could do our purification step in 20 or 30 minutes, that wouldn't be so bad. And so here you see, in about 15 minutes, we can bind most of the target. In about five minutes, we can get it off the bead. So we can put it on and get it off pretty quickly. And it turns out that you can zip them across the surface tension valves in only a couple of minutes. So the whole process adds about 25 minutes to the test. There are proteins in our body that have histidine. Histidine is one of the 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in our body. But it turns out that if you add a blocking reagent, you can get rid of most of those, and only your biomarker will bind. And so this is what happens. We take a blood sample. We put it in the first chamber. We capture it. We wash it. Then we elute it. We make it fall off the bead. And here's, we bind between 60 and 70% of all the biomarker in the original target. It stays on the bead. We don't see it in any of these wash chambers. And we can get almost all of it off, either in plasma or whole blood samples. This is just as good as a commercial kit, except this commercial kit takes about two hours. This takes us 20 minutes. Well, let's skip that. The most important thing here is this is a patient sample. It's a whole blood sample where we spiked in the malaria parasite. And you can see that at 200 parasites per microliter, which is the World Health Organization stated threshold for a positive test, there's nothing. But if you take the extraction cassette and take the last chamber and spot it on this RDT, we get that positive line at 200 parasites per microliter, the positive line at 100 parasites per microliter, the positive line at 50 parasites per microliter. In fact, this week, we've got the level of detection down to 10 parasites per microliter. Anything below 50 is asymptomatic. So a piece of tubing with some water and air bubbles a couple of hundred magnetic beads, and a horseshoe magnet can get us 
to where we need to be, asymptomatic detection of malaria. So we saw all of these bad kits. And so we asked the question, could we make the bad kits good kits? And so here you can see we could take even the worst kits, ones that were not detectable, and we turned them in to an incredible enhancement. So we get between five and 10 times enhancement for the kits that work well, and we can take kits that don't work and make them work at the World Health, or World Health Organization threshold. So what this means is that we can turn even the worst test kit, a test kit where maybe some of the antibody isn't so active, or it's been degraded, or they haven't used the best manufacturing processes, and we can salvage that test and make it work. So this is the extraction cassette as we've done it now. And we've also looked at making these enhancements to RDTs. This part works really well. But what we would really like to do is come up with a detection strategy. Eliminate the need for the RDT. Be able to detect the malaria parasite by ourselves, maybe in the tube or using some other mode of detection. But you have to remember, in my world, that would be, oh, fluorescence or an imaging or, you know, it would require electricity. <laughs> this is not going to work where we're going. So we've totally had to rethink what detection means in a low resource setting. And so the I want to talk to you about two ideas that we've had. And the first is a grant that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called the Grand Challenges Exploration Grant. And it was a grant about out of the box ideas. And our out of the box idea, coffee drinkers, how many coffee drinkers do we have? Yeah, all the college people, yeah, coffee drinkers, right? Finals are done, right? How many times have you looked at your counter and you see the coffee ring where, you know, you splash the coffee, there's the dark outer ring and the center ring? And I was looking at my office where there are a lot of coffee rings because I don't clean up very often after myself. And I said, how does that, how does that, how does that work? This is what chemists do. How does this work? And it turns out that lots of scientists have investigated the coffee ring phenomena. I don't know. Maybe this is what we do in our spare time. Okay. But it turns out that these were the people that, were try that weren't trying to get the bus unstuck. They were thinking about the coffee ring. How, do you, how does this work? So coffee is what we call a colloidal suspension. It's not a solution. You look at coffee. You can't really see through it. Right? Hopefully, we don't have the grounds in it, but we have all of those little bits and pieces of the coffee that give it its great flavor, its aroma, its chemistry. And it turns out that when you, when you drop a spot of coffee on the counter, you have, you have a drop, and the water at the edge of that drop evaporates faster than the water at the top of that drop. And what that means is that that sets up flow inside the drop. And so things in the middle of the drop flow to the edge of the drop. That's how we make a coffee ring. And so I thought, and here you can see this is a picture of them, of the particles actually flowing to the edge, where they pin and make this this concentrated ring of the particles in the coffee. And I thought to myself, what if we took the beads bound with the biomarker and dropped them on a, on a piece of glass? Those were particles. Could we get them to work just like a coffee ring? And if they bound, then you would have, if they formed a ring, the person would have malaria. If they didn't form a ring, the person wouldn't have malaria. No expensive reader, no fluorescence, no microscopes. About the same time, a group at UCLA showed that you could use this idea to separate different size particles, which was support for our idea. And so 
what did we have to do? Well, we needed to make a particle that would bind the histidine-rich protein. So here's how we, this is how we did it. Put the nickel on the outside, so we now have a bead that binds, that's got a metal. The metal should bind the histidine-rich protein. If we took these beads and we reacted them with the histidine-rich protein and then looked at them under a microscope, you can see they're aggregating into big particles. These big particles flow to the edge faster than small particles. Furthermore, because of the material we're using, we get a color change. The individual beads, unaggregated, are pink. The aggregated beads are purple. And so not only will we form a ring, but that ring should be purple. And then this is an experiment that shows, using light scattering, that the more protein you add, the larger the aggregates that you get. And so in fact, we take a, an infected sample, we spot it on a slide. The slide is treated with antibodies to bind the histidine-rich protein also. That's pretty ugly, because that's got everything. Cell debris, blood, salt, everything. But because the target is bound to the antibodies, which are bound to the glass, you can simply stick it in water and wash it off. And so this is what it looks like after you wash it. That's a positive result for malaria. And so we did a titration where we took different concentrations of the biomarker. And you can see that starting at about 48 nanometers, 48 nanomolar rather, we begin to form these rings. That's how much of the biomarker we need. It looks good all the way up to about 100 nanomolar. And then, it, then we start to get particles that are so big, they just fall to the middle of the drop. They don't flow at all. They just, they're not buoyant. They just fall to the middle. Well, this is great. This is a proof of concept. The problem is we're two orders of magnitude away from the concentration of the biomarker in a person with malaria. And so one of the things that we wanted to know was what could we do to make it more sensitive? Well, the beads we were using were so small that that sort of looks like it's trying to make a ring. But the beads were so small, they couldn't complete the circle. So what we did was we made bigger beads. We took polystyrene beads. We put a gold coat on them. On the gold coat of the polystyrene bead, we attached our ligand that has the nickel. And so now we went from a 15 nanometer bead, which is really, really tiny, to one micron bead, something that's three, a thousand times bigger. And when we did the same experiment, here's 100 nanomolar, here's 10 nanomolar, one nanomolar, 100 picomolar. This is now the clinical regime. This is an order of magnitude below the clinical regime, all by simply adding bigger beads to fill in the spaces of our coffee drop as it dried. It doesn't get much more low resource than a piece of tubing, a magnet, and a glass slide to put a drop on. The other thing that we did, the last thing that I'm going to talk about today, is in 2011, this group, the Lee group, published this paper about these iridium complexes. Iridium is a transition metal. If you remember your chemistry, I don't have, you know, the transition metals are the boring what people call the boring metals in the middle. I'm an inorganic chemist. I think they're the most exciting things. But they're the ones that you usually don't talk about until well, well, well into your career in chemistry, right? Yeah, OK. Um, the really neat thing about this iridium complex was that they showed that when you make it, we have two solvent molecules here. But when you expose those solvent molecules to histidine, just like the nickel, it goes from a clear solution to a solution that glows. Okay, this is called luminescence. It's the result of a photophysical process. We won't really talk about that. 
But the advantage is, is that there are long lifetimes. That is, you shine a photon of light on this molecule. It stays lit up for a long time, which is good if you want a detector. You want to be able to see something visually. These labile solvent ligands will only react with histidine. It's only turned on in the presence of histidine. And we can tune the electronic state of the molecule, which means that we can make it glow different colors. So different biomarkers can be glowing different colors. Well, this is, a, this is the chemistry slide of the talk. The important thing about this slide is that it's an easy molecule to make. So when we talk about deliverable, when you need to make a reagent for a device, you need to be able to mass produce it in kilogram quantities. The chemistry is all worked out. And so we did some experiments to see if this idea would actually work. And so this is a, a plot that shows the fluorescence, the glowing of the molecule. And we reacted it with all 20 amino acids. And the only amino acid that produced fluorescence was histidine. So of all the other amino acids, they bind. They just don't tune the excited state of the molecule so that it can glow. It's a unique property of histidine. But this works really well for us because our biomarker for malaria is full of histidine. Here you can see that uh, there's a pH dependence for the coordination of histidine. At low pH, we, we uh, don't get much signal. That's because the part of the molecule that binds to the iridium has a hydrogen on it. So it's blocked from binding at low pH. But at pH is above pH 6, we get great signal. There's great stability here at room temperature at 80 degrees uh, centigrade. Or at 4 degrees, the molecule is stable. This is good for something that's got to be on the back of a plane on a tarmac in sub-Saharan Africa. And with the right choice of buffer, we can even increase the fluorescent signal. So we can make the molecule more fluorescent than it normally is. The challenge that we have is that so many molecules have histidines on them. And so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to go back to the extractionator. We're going to take a biological sample to bind our specific target and then eliminate the background. And so this is what the background is in a plasma sample because there are lots of proteins that have histidines that bind to the molecule. And we're going to wash all of that away as we go through each wash chamber. So how does it work? Okay, well, it's not that complicated. We sterilize my hand. You take a lancet. I don't know how dark it's going to get. If it gets too dark, we might have to add another light. It's still a little dark. We prick my finger. <laughs> I know my students have been waiting for that for a long time. Right? <laughs> we squeeze it into the solution and mix it up. We take a light. Oh no, I have malaria. This is something, right? This, this is a handheld light because we have a huge volume. But it's very simple. And the molecule is very stable and long-lived. And with just a little bit of a sample,
we get a, we get a signal. And so the idea is we'd want to make a glow stick that was essentially a detector for malaria. So all you have to do is you have your tube. You run your magnet along your tube. The last chamber, you crack it. You shake it up. And you know whether or not somebody has malaria. This is a low resource analyzer diagnostic test that eliminates all the problems that people historically have had for rapid diagnostics. It's cheap. It's inexpensive. It doesn't require electricity or clean water. Sample in signal that is obvious out. This is what we're working on to detect asymptomatic malaria in patients. So that when we go to the villages, people will, will see what happens. Now, in 2012, Discover Magazine wrote a little feature on our article on our technology. And we don't really expect, this is a good description of what I've told you, but in the field, we don't really expect people to be dragging their own magnet. We need something you know, more robust than that. So what we're thinking about is making a ballpoint pen where essentially every click of the pin advances the magnet down the chamber in a reproducible fashion. So it doesn't matter who uses it. Everybody can click a ballpoint pin, which would advance the magnet from one chamber to the next, moving the beads down to the final signal where the iridium module was. You crack it open, and you see whether or not you have malaria. So this is the prototype that we're currently developing that will be deployed in Zambia a year from July. And so this is what we hope at the end. These are some of the you know, children are really happy everywhere around the world. These guys didn't have malaria, so they gave us the thumbs up. None of this would be possible without the students in my lab. Uh, Kirsten Rick, Ricks and Nick Adams were instrumental in the original design of these molecules. Alex Denton was an undergraduate in my lab who worked on the, the coffee stain diagnostic assay. We do our work in collaboration with biomedical engineering, the lab of Rick Hazelton, particularly Josh Trantum was instrumental in helping us. Our work has been funded by the Gates Foundation, the NIH, the National Science Foundation, and Vanderbilt in a very innovative program called the Ideas Program gave us some seed money to develop our first ideas. And I thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about, well, anything. Yes. It doesn't, OK? I, I cheated. I, I pre-bound the target into the, uh, to the, you know, into the, the, into the thing. I didn't even really prick myself. I hate to disappoint my students. You know, it's fake. I now have a biological sharp, though, that I have to dispose of properly, or OSHA will come and get me. Yes? as the histidine rich pro so so there are a couple of different biomarkers in in the for somebody who has parasites so choosing a biomarker is one of the hardest things that we actually do in in the research for finding a diagnostic for any disease it's one of the things that investigators all over campus in the cancer center in the chemistry lab in biomedical engineering we're always looking for that unique biomarker what does the disease state have that the healthy individual does not have? And in the case of malaria, the malaria parasite pumps out the histidine-rich protein into the host at 
well, for per parasite, it's a pretty high concentration. But then it gets diluted in your blood. We have about four liters of blood inside of our body. And so we get down to very low concentrations to that 1 to 0.1 nanomolar concentration of target. Um, there are a few other targets in malar for malaria that are, that are not histidine rich. We'd have to come up with a different detection strategy. Some of those we're very interested in because they, they're expressed in the saliva. And so if you, didn't, if you didn't have to stick a patient, particularly a patient who potentially has HIV AIDS, this is a big uh, safety factor. And then in southern Zambia, there's a pretty big cultural resistance to having blood drawn. But they're more than happy to, to have a collection from, from their mouth taken. And so if we could find biomarkers in the saliva that were different, that would be a huge, that's what the second cohort, the second year of the, of the grant is looking at. Yes? Yes, it does. So basically, you know, the, to detect asymptomatic malaria in the sort of matcha center. So they've done a great job of knocking it down. And the way they do that is they did a mass drug administration. They treated everybody in, in the area, in the region, with anti-malarial drugs. And then, of course, that eliminated malaria in a number of people. The asymptomatic people didn't show malaria, but they were carriers. Eventually, there's an outbreak. And during the outbreak, you go and you test the entire community. And if you're able to detect that asymptomatic le level, you get not only the people that are showing signs, but all the other asymptomatic carriers that have been generated. So you know, typically, in an eradication campaign, you'd be doing it every time there was an outbreak, or every time you were going in and doing a mass drug administration. In, say, Zimbabwe, where they haven't had nearly so much success, typically what happens is somebody comes up to their pharmacy and they ask for malaria RDT, and they take the, they take the test. Or even worse, they don't use the RDT. They just, ask, they just have fever and chills, and they ask for the anti-malarial drug. And that's a huge problem because just like how we've created super antibiotic resistant drugs in the United or bugs in the United States, if you don't have malaria, but you take an anti-malarial medicine, you begin to spread resistance in the parasite. And so that's a, that's a huge problem. Um, the other thing is, is that there are lots of things in sub-Saharan Africa that are going to give you fever and chills, not just malaria. Um, and so now that we're done, now that chloroquine no longer works, now that the cheap drugs are gone, people are much more concerned about treating the disease with the right drug. And so the, RD, the use of RDTs has, has risen rather than just doing drug treatment. Yes? Well, in our test, uh, in this first generation test, no. Uh, basically, their geography, it would be malaria or not. And then because we know that the resistance usually is, has geographic constraints, they would be given a particular anti-malarial drug. For an eradication campaign, that would be different. So it turns out that people who have a deficiency of an enzyme called glucose 6-dehydrogenase reductase, if you take common anti-malarial drugs and you have that deficiency, you die. And so that's about 15 to 20 percent of the endemic regions in Africa. People have this enzyme deficiency. And so before we go in and treat everybody with the cheapest, most effective drug, we're going to have to design diagnostics that say malaria or no, deficient or no. And so that is an example of a diagnostic that would determine 
the treatment. And that's, that's the kind of diagnostic that we'll ultimately have to develop if we really want to think about global eradication for the disease. Yes, in a, in a perfect world, we would do it. It would all be on the same test strip. Yes? Did you say anything about the vaccination? Okay, uh, the vaccination doesn't work. Uh, so, so, so the situation is, is that GlaxoSmithKline has done a field trial of a vaccine candidate. And in a very small subset, it looked very promising, 50%. When they looked at the data for the full set of kids that had been treated, it was less than 35%. The problem with the vaccine is that the parasite is smarter than the scientist. And so the parasite has all of these different life cycle stages. And each one of these stages elicits a different immune response in the patient. And so it's very difficult to come up with a vaccine that will capture the parasite in each one of its stages, as opposed to, say, a chickenpox vaccine that just finds the chickenpox circulating. You know, it activates your immune system. Chickenpox is spreading through your, your bloodstream. And so it's easy to catch because you only have to look for it in one place. But a vaccine for malaria has to look for malaria in the liver and in the bloodstream, and in the sexual stages. And we just don't have the vaccine technology yet to effectively develop that. The other thing about the RSK, uh, the GSK trial, was that the time of effectiveness of the vaccine for the 30% that it was effective for was about half as long as they wanted it to be. And that's a real problem when you have to go to these places <coughs> and stick a kid to give them the vaccine. To see how much of a problem it is, all you have to do is read about the polio eradication. Right? There's a vaccine that we understand very well. We only had 600 cases of polio last year in two countries, Nigeria and Afghanistan. And we still can't get rid of the disease with an effective vaccine. Primarily because we can't get the vaccine to those rural remote communities where they need it. And that's pretty much a lifetime. They now say we need a booster for polio if you're in a polio endemic region. But polio is by and large a lifetime one-shot vaccine. If you've got to go back and immunize kids every three years for malaria, that's not going to work very well. And so that's sort of where the, the vaccine trial is right now. Um, the initial ideas just haven't panned out the way that, that we have hoped. Yes? OK, so in the human host, there is no histidine-rich protein. So if, we took my, so if we had done the real test today, it wouldn't have glowed at all. We do have a protein called the histidine-rich glycoprotein. But it doesn't have nearly as many histidines as the, as the protein biomarker. So we can add a blocking reagent that keeps that from binding to our beads. So we almost get no false positives. Right? But it's not entirely uh, impossible to get a false positive. The other thing that can happen with the coffee ring is that if you had something that caused the particles to clump together that wasn't the protein, that would cause a false positive. But we really haven't seen that in our control experiments so far. Everything just doesn't, the only thing that really promotes, we've rigged it so that the only thing that promotes these particles coming together is the biomarker from the parasite. And so that limits the false positives. But it's something we always look out for. Right? The nice thing is, is that a lot of the other diseases that these people would have in sub-Saharan Africa, they don't produce histidine-rich biomarkers. It's really a unique biomarker to the malaria parasite. And that gives us a real advantage in fighting it. Yes? Are there any problems getting something like this manufactured both for your pilot study so that if you want to do a live on a large scale? 
So the, the great thing about this technology is you know, we can mass produce these so that we can sell these. I bought 12 for a dollar at Michael's for today. Okay? That's, and, and that's with the profit that Michael's is taking. With the 50% coupon, I cut out of the paper. And so it might have been a 40% week. I don't know. But so, so this technology is inexpensive to, to mass produce. One of the things that we found is that um, what we hope is when we set up the network with Zambia, we came up with an effective transfer of intellectual property from Vanderbilt to Zambia so that because the technology is so amenable to sort of common manufacturing practices, we'd actually be able to manufacture and create a diagnostics industry from the ground up in Zambia. And so that's what we're hoping to do. All right, so uh, thank you all for your time. I hope I've answered your questions. <laughs>